I'm Gene, and this is Perfect Flow. I'm a New Zealand-based athlete and coach focused on optimizing performance, health, and well-being. While I have a professional background in biomedical engineering, I've chosen to follow my more immediate passions for running, endurance, adventure, movement, nutrition, lifestyle, community, psychology, and personal growth. My goal in starting this podcast is to connect with bright minds to extract the information I need to live a life that makes sense and feels good, and share those conversations with others. Apart from your favorite podcast app, the best places to follow my work are perfectflow.nz, genebeverage.nz, and perfectflow on Facebook. Hey guys, hope you're well. Gene here, as usual. I was up in Whangarei a few weekends ago and staying with my good friend Tom Reynolds. He's been a big part of my my enjoyment in sport and also a number of projects uh, rela- related to sport, but um, such as my my shop Grassy Knoll Outdoor. He was um, a big part of big part of that, but has, has since moved on and is focusing a lot on uh, medicine. And uh, one of the other projects he's got going on now is Ascent Medical, which is, um, I guess it's it's a side project when you consider how much how much work the doctors are doing on their usual full time job. Um, but of course, it, it's super cool to uh, get get the insights from Tom as he spends time on both sides of the finish line as a competitor and as a race doctor. So we, we set up the mics off the cuff and um, got in a little conversation. Uh, we had fun doing it and hope that some people can, can find it useful. Uh, the things we talk about are Tom's background in sport, a super keen mountain biker and got into pretty much every sport he could, he could find that would take him further into the outdoors uh, throughout school and university. And I think that's a, a common story for people who have become quite successful adventure racers and multi-sporters there just always keen to try something new and after years and years of hacking away different sports have have quite a a repertoire Uh, his his training for adventure racing so some of the specific kind of sessions they like to do i think that was uh, cool to hear some of the strategies because of course it's very different to the running i do which is is pretty prescribed and uh, i know largely how the session's going to go before i head out but with adventure racing uh, you're never quite sure exactly what's going to unfold. The terrain and nature often has other plans. We also talk about some of his race experiences and uh, the infection from God's Own uh, a few years back in, in Southland, the foot infection that uh, took a few teams out of the race and left a, a lot of people with some uh, very uncomfortable infections. And we talk about his um the best advice uh, from the race doctor perspective, which I think is really applicable to ultra runners and uh, endurance adventure athletes. Uh, specifically, we talk about the exercise associated hyponatremia, which is um, sometimes called kind of overhydration, not, not the best way to describe it, but um, that's what it looks like from the outside, people just drinking too much water. And that that's a really common one that there's some understandings around about that. So it was cool to talk about that. Uh, he presents the idea of a plan B nutrition. So most of us really just have a plan A when we're out there. But um, as I've found, it doesn't always go to plan. And having a, a secondary nutrition plan that you've also practiced uh, was, was a really interesting idea. Uh, so we talk about that a little bit. And Tom defines the, the true finish line as as not the finish line itself, but the finish line beyond the medical tent. And I think if you take Tom's advice seriously and put some of his ideas into practice, uh, you might find you're spending less time in the medical tent with Tom and uh, getting back to your hotel room a little bit sooner. So uh, definitely worth worth trying to practice some of the things that he mentions. And Tom also did the Revenant this year. So it was interesting to hear about uh, his thoughts after uh, hitting the, the start line of that brutal race so i hope you enjoy it hope you get something out of this and if you want to hear more more stuff like this then just reach out to me maybe suggest some other people to talk to or just say which episodes you, you like and got the most value from and i'll try to find other things similar 
So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Tom Reynolds. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Hi there, Gene. Is a uh, podcast something you've thought you might be doing at some stage in the future with their increase in popularity? Uh, n- not really, to be honest. <laughs> um, I hadn't really expected to do one, but it, it'll be interesting to see what we can talk about. Yeah, um, and there's a lot of things I, I do want to talk about. You're someone who's been involved in a number of different avenues that I find quite interesting. Um, the first thing that I was quite keen to get into, of course, is adventure racing and endurance sport in general uh what, what's your background with endurance sport do you want to just bring the listeners up to speed with your experience and your passions like what what brought you into endurance sport and how you've um got to where you are now okay i guess to really keep it pretty brief i'm i'm no champion adventure racer um back when i was a teenager i started with orienteering and mountain biking uh took those pretty seriously and followed them through as i entered my late teens and 20s i moved more into Multi sport and adventure racing. I was just always attracted by getting more into the backcountry and outdoors. I did um, coast to coast and God Zone in the same year when I first tried them, and I thought God Zone would be a one off and coast would be would be for me. Mm-hmm. But actually, it's turned out being the other way around. Um, and I've competed in a few more adventure races since then. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm no um, I know you've had Stu on the podcast. I'm no Stu Lynch. Yeah, he's um, incredible. But I'm. Uh, certainly enthusiastic about it and um have had a pretty consistent team to race with over the last five years yeah and did you revisit coast no i haven't actually been back i think the um logistical problem is probably the main thing being north island based it's um there's a big opportunity cost to choose to do a race like that so and not just the race day you mean heading down there to do the river beforehand a number of times that's right yes because the course kind of changes and stuff you've got to get down there that's right yeah there's definitely a um You've got to, if you want to do it well um you definitely have to spend a lot of time adventure racing um you can go to an area and mm. get, and get used to it um but i don't think that that's i mean it's certainly helpful but maybe not quite as valuable as for a one-day multi-sport race mm-hmm. cool and then uh you you left school and studied university yeah i went to i did medical school at auckland mm. university and uh i finished it's quite a long time ago thinking about it it's yeah. quite a long time ago now it's about seven years ago so i've been working in around the country doing various um medical jobs since then cool uh with with adventure racing when did you kind of settle on a team i know after talking to Stu, uh, he had quite, quite a consistent team uh, when he first started H- how has your team evolved uh our team we so has been pretty consistent throughout yeah. we have had some little tweaks and changes here and there as people haven't been available um but we have probably like there's probably about four guys who've raced in the team and th- and two three girls who've raced in the mm-hmm. team and m- for the most part we we get on um we what what do we, we for the most part we get on really really well yeah. um and we it's not really like a, a a problem that's made us not race together it's really been practicalities hmm. um people living in different parts of the world having different priorities um and what about training school? together did you guys get much chance uh, initially we did so matt i raced a lot with with matt jeans he's someone who i've done pretty much all my races with and we lived together for a wee while and then um miriam vandenboom she lived nearby okay so i've been able to train with her a wee bit um and then when i was in rotorua hannah Lowe, who we've raced a bit with could train with her hmm. um and have made the effort to try and get to do at least a big mission with the rest of the team and the build up to big races yeah i imagine you you want to fi- find that zone where people are beginning to struggle to see what characteristics come out yeah you uh, don't want to be totally surprised by how people true are race yeah day. yeah i think as well like the part of the beauty of adventure racing is like the training the whole training process for it you can't possibly go out there having not spent a lot of time in the bush um and it's no better way to do these things than with someone else so might as well like sh- share the excitement mm-hmm. about going and trying something new trying to make a loop work with other people and might as well do it with the people you're racing with can you explain that a little bit more contrasting it to multi-sport i think probably with i mean okay massive caveat here i'm no great multi-sporter i'm just uh, <laughs> I, I just dabble really um but i 
certainly I can comment probably more compared to orienteering and mountain biking. Orienteering and mountain biking go out super structured. You've yep. got a session. You are much more focused on a single parameter. Like you're doing today, I'm working on my power. Today, mm-hmm. I'm working on my leg speed. Adventure racing, I think, is way more just about getting out there. And sure, you can have a session and say, okay, we're trying to work on, we just want to get a good long time on our feet but it's much more vague and mm-hmm. much more um much more much much more about just getting out there and doing it yeah. um you don't need to spend the hours and 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 by that i mean you don't need to spend 40 hours out on one hit but you can go and spend a six hour session out in the hills and maybe have a little bit less singly focused direction than you would have and is that because the challenges that come at you in adventure racing just come out of the woodwork when you're out there on a big mission i i think so and i think possibly more more importantly if you're wanting to be able to have the attributes to do well in one of those races you need to be used to just doing lots of different sports all the time Mm -hmm. um and and again i've caveat again i'm i'm not by any means at the very top of the top of Mm -hmm. the field um but certainly I think when we've had our better races, it's followed periods of sustained time in the outdoors mm-hmm. um, and not necessarily when we've done like more structured fast training. Yep. And by unstructured, do you mean kind of impromptu or they've all been kind of well, well planned and stuff in advance, you know, the route that you're going to do, or are you just going out and winging it? I think you think I'm more organized than yeah, I am. Yeah, you're really. just winging it. We're just you? winging it. Yeah, largely. So oh, that's cool. you might do a big weekend and you might say, yeah. okay, we're going to all meet up here we're mm-hmm. going to try and do a overnight or something here and uh, then we'll try and do this on the next day and we'll mm-hmm. bring the pack rafts like you might have something planned in that way and yeah. people will be planned enough to book affairs and know when they're arriving mm-hmm. but not to the degree that it's like we're going to do this climate zone three and <laughs> all that sort yeah. of stuff yeah and i guess if something unexpected happens you don't make it to where you're hoping to stay overnight you end up staying overnight somewhere else which is just a different yeah route like it's just as good it's just different that's right and i think there's like an an, i think it's true for all off-track sports i think there is an element of terrain which you kind of start to get a feel for Mm -hmm. like in the upper north island where i've done a lot of training yeah you kind of just get a feel for looking at an area and you're like oh it's probably not very i probably wouldn't go through there right and And that's information that the map isn't going to tell you well, not to that level of precision it, it's hard because you kind of step back and you try and say why do i think that and yeah. you can be like oh maybe it's the contours maybe it's the aspects maybe it's the vegetation maybe it's i just know this area a little yeah but i think going out into the terrain for an adventure race you can the little bit of information you do pick up in advance is information that relates to that you might learn a, a little of that and it's the same with orienteering. You get the same thing yeah. as well. Different terrain types. You Yeah, you develop these intuitions about things that aren't explicit on the map, but are also not totally ambiguous. Yeah. You yeah. can work them out. Definitely. I think that's an intuition. I think you, I mean, there's a limited value. I think I think you can only get limited benefit in that regard for adventure racing. Like mm-hmm. if you wanted to, or like the Rotorua, um, if we use that as an example, the Rotorua gods and coming up, there's lots of different places they could go. I think a couple of weekends in and around the hills, if you've never been there, will be a great way to just get a feel for what are the spurs like what are the valleys like how small does a river get before you do not want to be there yeah all those sort of things as opposed to like course familiarization i don't think there's a massive value in going to trying to guess a route yeah also it kind of defeats the purpose of it it's quite fun in a race to be going somewhere you haven't been before yeah and that definitely makes it memorable yeah oh, that's really cool uh with training the different disciplines is that approach you're taking that approach across all disciplines like you're planning a big mountain bike mission somewhere and pat paddling missions as well or yep. is that is that just the trekking that you're no nah, it's pretty well? much everything i'm pretty i think my teammates would agree i'm pretty useless peddler um mm. it kind of comes and goes i think it comes down to what you love because it's a bit unstructured you tend to gravitate towards those things yep. you really enjoy um training up in the in northland the paddling's pretty good. Rotorua was pretty good. Um, mainly lake-based. Yeah. Um, so you just wouldn't have as much of that specific river stuff. So mm-hmm. you kind of couldn't go out and do those same river-based packraft sessions or kayaking sessions, but you could right. get plenty of lake in. And it's kind of 
there's definitely that social element to it and sharing it with other people. So mm. it would be all three sports would be relatively unstructured. So wait, what, what have been your favorite sessions over the years? You must have done some some of these big missions you're talking about. Were there any longer than weekend, like longer than two day training missions that uh, you took on? Or if not, well, what are the best? What are the best ones you've done? I'd be really keen for some of the listeners who are you know, looking for what is adventure racing training actually yeah. like. Yeah, you know, what are some of these big missions? So that, I, th- I think that probably some of the best ones have been um, trying to m- see if a route will work and trying to make it happen. So, okay. um, with so a, a suspect route, you're finding something that is obviously route. doable. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, or maybe you've heard it's doable, or you think, oh yeah, we can probably do that. But there's a degree of unknown. Okay. So, uh, Gene Z and um, Miriam. Um, mm-hmm. And I did a did one down near Murchison a couple of years ago up the Matiri River towards mm-hmm. it's called Thousand Acre Plateau mm-hmm. and it's this big elevated limestone plateau it has a feature on it called the Needle and the Haystack which mm-hmm. are a little wee peak and that's kind of joined by a quite sharp ridge to like a flatter bigger peak which is the hay- haystack mm-hmm. and so we shot through there up. We got in quite late at night, started walking, just slept on the side of the track at like three or four in the morning. Mm-hmm. Got up the next morning at like a lazy time. Then that next day we went up over the plateau and then we carried on and planned to link down by following the ridge onto a track that came out the Martari Valley, which would have a reasonable bush bash mm-hmm. to get there. So we ended up, we spent another night just up on the top there, having spent a while looking for some water and then yeah. bombed down this bush bash, which was pretty fine really there was some like steep parts near the top but bush bashing down is always much preferable to bush bashing up yeah and then um hooned out the track along the river valley the next day cool and that was pretty cool there was it was interesting too because you go and look in the hut box and like one of the huts mcconchie's hut i think it is you look in there and there's a bunch of other adventure races names who had been in there i think this yeah. was in the lead up to god's own Tasman. <laughs> and so you see names like tim farrant and that sort of yeah. stuff in the book and you think okay we're this is a good place to do it. Right, training. and those guys who really live it, you're following in their footsteps. Yeah, to a certain degree. So that <laughs> yeah. was that was um, definitely a really good session. Um, Joe... Have you got the map from that? Um, I think we Could just... a bit old? D- digitally? I'd be keen to, yeah, I'm to not share sure it. Got, I'm not sure if we've got it digitally. Yeah, we could try to recreate it. Yeah, we could try and recreate it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Easy as. Um, I think I've pointed some other people in the direction since we went there. Yeah, okay. It's, you must have really good. liked it. Yeah. Um, I think also trying to redefine, so that's one example of like a new place. I think the other types of sessions are cool. Other ones where you try and make a challenge out of something that's that's a usual place for you to train. Mm-hmm. So living in Rotorua recently, um, another mate who does a bit of adventure racing, Joe Ray, we needed to do a pack craft session and we often run near Lake Tarawera. We really like North, the Northern Tarawera Trail is probably mm-hmm. the best part, but it's a bit of a hike to get there. So we thought, oh, well, let's just do it as part of a pack crafting training mm. so just go and park where we'd usually park for a kayak sessions or for a run on the um hot water beach track run the hot water beach track jump in the kayak and then the pack crafts paddle around the outside of the lake to northern right. tarawera run the northern tarawera paddle around the next part of the lake do a bit of a run through the tarawera se- tarawera village yeah. jump off the jumping rock with the pack crafts and then paddle back to the cars <laughs> which is quite cool it ended up being yeah. like a six and a half hour mixture yeah. of pack craft and running we got plenty of practice at inflating and deflating the rafts yeah and um it was a good way just to settle on like a comfy way to be set up in the boat despite the yeah. fact we're in different teams but that also was close to home it's a nice satisfying session yeah and yeah you kind of redefine what is a a normal thing yeah there's a really different way to use an area that you'd just yeah otherwise be a little repetitive definitely. or, or definitely familiar with it yeah anything like trying to pick off peaks like up around it's always tempting when you live somewhere to be like all right yeah. we need to take off all these peaks in one go or we need to like try and get around this thing yeah in one go i think those sessions are quite a good way to to do something i think if you're yeah. stuck i mean it's tricky if you're in real central auckland but even then there'll be urban what urban yeah. options you can you could do and how much training did you do at night time um probably not enough lately oh yeah yeah i think it's quite i think navigation at night i think probably two things that that are really key and navigation at night and being like in tune with the topo map scale yeah so orienteering 
I think certainly from my own experiences, going into an adventure race with heaps of orienteering is good because your orienteering process is good, but you need to have some sharpeners on a topo map so you get like used to, to the scale. Calibrate your intuition into the one to fifty thousand versus the one to ten thousand scale. Yeah, and the smoothness of everything. Yeah, things that aren't Ooh. there and all that. So you need to do that. And then I also think that getting some time at night and part of it I think is speed judgment. Everything gets a bit distorted at night time. Mm -hmm. Um and also it just gives you a bit of confidence to to experiment with carrying on further when your internal alarm bells are saying we need to stop you can just like go cool, through because cool. you know you've done it mm. uh yeah there in any other sessions that you kind of wish you had have done mm. like you've did, done some races and just been like god we should have really kayaking i think every race i do I'm like, <laughs> I, need to do more, I need to do way more kayaking yeah and and is that just because you love mountain biking so much yeah i think so yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean i've done some great kayaking paddling sessions yeah and like it's cool when you get into the groove and like we're doing plenty in rotorua yeah. and um, that sort of stuff but i just haven't really i mean i enjoy it but i haven't yeah. quite got the like love for it that i have yeah mm. and i think if you if you really love something like you'll do like the off season right the equivalent to the off season like, you're not just building up to a race you're just always doing the sport yeah I think that's probably a byproduct of the quite ad hoc nature to training. I think people who have structured training programs, like it's, it gives you a lot more confidence to go out and do a sport you're less familiar in because mm -hmm. you're like, oh, well, so I'm trusting the process. I've got these sessions planned. I need to do these to improve this. Whereas I guess I'm kind of in a holding pattern with those other sports. Mm -hmm. Like I'm mountain biking and running. I know like intuitively what sessions to do, but I think you look at people who've improved a lot and it's through consistency and a more structure to it oh yeah yeah i think for me personally the times mm -hmm. when i've been best at paddling are where i've taken a far more structured approach so maybe that would be helpful but mm -hmm. yeah did you get advice like from a coach to um i think sort of think? from from friends and people i know so nothing i had a shoulder i had a little bit of input years and years ago when i had a shoulder yeah. injury but yeah not really okay yeah. Sweet. And how many gold zones have you done? What, what have been your favorites? Yeah. Can you share some stories from? Um, I've done five. Shit. I think. Five already. Yeah. Old timer. No. Well, some people medium, have done Medium time. I think I've done five. Yeah. Yeah. I've done, I've done five. We'll yeah. Say. I always and just feel like I've still got that image of you like being, getting into adventure racing. Yeah. It's like, it's still really stuck with me. Um, like, oh, Tom's an adventure racer now. I'm certainly not a, um, <laughs> I'm compared I'm, to the experience of some of those guys. Yeah. yeah you're no, still no, 20 years no, short. <laughs> I'm like it, yeah. Yeah. I'm still very baby faced and green. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the real highlights, I mean, actually our first God zone was, was really cool. Yeah, where I, was that? That was in Kaikoura. Yeah. And we had repeatedly through the race moments of like, wow, we've got so far still to go. Like you'd basically get to a next <laughs> stage and you'd be like, oh, we've done, but then you'd be like, and now we've got to do 101 <laughs> kilometers in these rafts down this river and it was just like really mind expanding in terms of mm -hmm. what you can actually do yeah um did you find you went a lot further than what you thought just because you're always you're always moving yeah you just keep going that's the yeah. thing that's the amazing thing about it i think we probably let our minds escape a bit too much then and didn't focus so much on the stage you're doing it's like circle of influence, circle of concern. Yeah, yeah. You could worry about all the stages that are to come, but right. ultimately the only thing you can do is the only area you have influence on is what you're doing right now. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you've got to do. Um, and but it definitely took your breath away a bit, the, the magnitude yeah, of the, like, the whole I th event. I think we had multiple times through the race where we had that hit us. Um, and that was really cool. We finished that race off with, uh, like, a, we had a really good last day, mm. powered through a whole lot of teams who were struggling a bit more and then had like this crazy tussle with bivouac who mm. were objectively much better than us yeah. but had had some hit some adversity along the way and on the last trek mountain bike stage we were toing and froing and back and forth it was really cool and then they hopped into the kayaks expecting a battle and we were bloody useless to be honest uh, <laughs> so you just couldn't, beat us couldn't for like an hour and a half yeah, okay, to the finish okay. um still that's really cool and for young people coming in you must have been like amped for the for the next round yeah. after that first first experience and i remember watching as well and being like oh yeah this is cool yeah like our, our boys are out there battling against the big dogs yeah i don't know it's, it's an interesting sport because you there are a lot of unpredictable things that happen yeah. in it and it's also really hard to predict what is going to be the biggest highlight of a race yeah um 
but I think there's always a there's so many things you can improve like trying to think of all the things that you could do better you have this even more unattainable like perfect race like in orienteering mm. you never have a really have a perfect race yeah event racing there are infinitely more variables <laughs> it's five days of things to yeah. go wrong there's even more ways you can improve yeah yeah what about some rough times uh we had i mean it'd be good to have jeansy here to hear about his oh yeah his feet but yeah you can definitely i don't know yeah, we've had to bad, get we've him been, on but so we had to we we didn't finish god's own in fjordland yeah which was a bit was of sad. which was a bit of a bummer we were we put quite a bit of effort in, mm-hmm. and we were racing with um, it was me, Jeansy, uh, Miriam, and Pat Higgins. Mm-hmm. Um, and Pat is a beast, and was really good. Miriam is a beast, and was really mm-hmm. good. It was, it was, yeah, we were, we were cracking along. Um, Jeansy was going good, but unfortunately had a problem with his feet. Um, we've actually subsequently looked like published an article about that. Yeah, or really keen to hear. Like, feet, I, but, I, I remember the investigation process kind of starting but i don't know i don't know where it ended up yeah so i get i guess jeansy was one of many people in that race who had a problem with their feet while mm-hmm. it was while it was happening um kind of a um similar story for most people where you get like a bit of a sandy feeling on your feet or a bit of itchiness a bit of heat okay. and then they'll start to get a bit sore you'll start to get this rash usually around the toes but also in the arch of the foot and then they just more and more sore more and more okay. hot and then some people developed like quite bad infections mm-hmm. um and unfortunately that's what happened to gen z he didn't really get the chance to decide he was crook enough that we kind of were like he needs to stop so yeah. and i think people were using the word trench foot early on yeah before they kind of revised that is that something that happens quite frequently and they just yeah. kind of assumed it was i think the, the foot same? issues there's like if so what we ended up doing is we published like a case history so Mm -hmm. a case or a case report a case report is kind of where you have a a medical case and then you present the case and then do a discussion around the literature to do with that problem so we were really we we had in our team we had three doctors there were like another team we're good friends with had had three doctors and a nurse um there were um other teams which had three or four like there was a whole okay. group of us who were all you just banded together and yeah we were we were discussing and talking about the relative like what is this there were, is this an immersion foot syndrome is this something that's related to the feet being really wet mm-hmm. is this a bacterial infection is it related to the normal bacteria on the feet or is it a fungal infection yeah and we thought it had elements of of all of those okay um and it was really really quite curious because the it responded to some treatments better than others and it mm. presented differently in some people rather than others and then the other person who had a lot of knowledge about this was lynn john who's the race doctor for god's mm. own and has been for a few years and she'd instituted quite a few treatments on the fly for people during the race so mm. me and lynn and i and a couple of the other um gene Z and another guy another doctor involved kind of put it all pen to paper and i guess from that the take home was probably there's there is definitely a continuum a few mm. people displayed some of the immersion foot syndrome features so like the characteristic foot appearances um less of an infectious picture and then there was this other big group of people who had infections and there's mm. probably a continuum of the pathogen that's causing it at one end you'd have pure fungal like tinea athlete's foot really that just gets like really extreme yeah so Ul- so- ulcerative tinea pedis so wow ulcer- it's like actually munching through your skin <clears throat> pretty much yeah wow. and then you have gram negative toe web infection so gram mm. negative bacteria type of bacteria okay that that often live on your feet mm-hmm. and can cause a type of infection and so otherwise you know within the scope of a healthy yeah you might biome, have some, you might have a small them, number of them hanging out yeah healthy maybe but yeah you might have them living on your you'll have them living on your yeah. feet anyway you have inevitably a weird the bugs on your feet are a bit different <laughs> from the bugs elsewhere but there's those the, an interaction between those fungi and the bacteria set up a situation where you have a an infection of the skin that probably contains both they probably mm. help each other to get worse right and you've got a body that is relatively immunosuppressed from the state of the race Mm -hmm. um and add into that like probably some injuries to the skin barrier through feet that are getting macerated or feet that are getting cut or blistered or things like that and you have this situation where you because that's your barrier right that's your actual yeah biological protection yeah pretty much so you have this like polymicrobial 
multi-organism infection of your feet which gets worse and worse and Jeansy's what case seemed to be a bit more like mainly fungal whereas yeah. other people who we saw they would have things which were much more typical of a bacterial infection mm. um we tried to gather some more information this year at god's own but i think from the I, I need to catch up with lynn about it but i think that the certainly from the people i've spoken to who were there said that there was a real lack of foot issues this year which is great but terrible for collecting more data right there's, yeah. there's still big question marks that might never get answered unless we go back to yeah, well, we southland for we five days we didn't really get any swabs of the feet which is of uncertain significance if we swab yeah. the feet we'll, we'll not be certain if we're getting the bug that's actually causing the problem right. or the bugs that just live there yeah so that's a problem the people who reviewed the article one person thought that was a problem the other people thought oh doesn't really matter because you're just going to grow whatever bugs are on the feet mm-hmm. um i think that probably the upshot as well is ed so ed who we used to race with had this quite rigorous foot treatment plan that he did after having a horrendous run with feet once and he was a big advocate of powders mm-hmm. and trying to just like talcum powder to like uh, he, dry it out he mixed something. a bit of the like neat feet stuff like or grand's remedy the like antifungal stuff oh yeah so a bit of antifungal powder a bit of talc and he was pretty big on like a little bit of like emollient like uh or a um kind of chamois cream kind of thing mm-hmm. on the on the hot spots that were developing so you'd be like fin- whip your socks off dry them off put a little mm-hmm. bit of the emollient on the like raggedy looking bits yeah chuck some powder on chuck some powder in your socks pull them back on and try and keep them dry and right do that relatively frequently and what if your socks get wet would he like well, swap the socks over at some stage he experimented with like the water like those waterproof seal skin socks oh and, wow like, he'd tape around the top of them i don't <laughs> i don't know if that, in. i don't know if that makes a massive difference sweaty inside anyway it's inescapable i think you yeah. you're you can't keep your feet dry so you just have to change frequently and give them mm. an opportunity to dry and hey that works yep. pretty well um mm. so i think that probably something antifungal is probably good not all antifungals are made equal some yep. are fungostatic so will hold the stop growth right. others are fungicidal so we'll kill them yeah um uh a manuka or tea trees probably has got a bit mm-hmm. of an antifungal effect yeah um so something that's got a little bit of manuka in it yeah maybe um or tea tree extract whatever it is mm-hmm. the and it kind of bore out i mean everything from god's own field is a bit anecdotal about what people did to their feet yeah. and all that sort of stuff and it's too late now because people won't remember and even after the race retrospective data is never as good yeah so i think objectively people who tended to use a fungicidal cream and or something like containing a tea tree extract generally yeah. did better with their feet okay generally but there was yeah. a massive overlap were there like antibacterial baths or something i recall that the race yeah so they had, had to kind of to control the because obviously the national park um want to protect which is mm-hmm. important yeah of course um and waterborne pests like didymo are in some areas mm-hmm. some watersheds and not others mm-hmm. so we had to do frequent foot baths in mm-hmm. detergent um theoretically could have had an impact right um because detergent of course will kill bacteria more as it, it will break down the normal oily layer of your skin so we normally oh, have oils okay. in our skin if you chuck a bit of detergent on there you're going to remove the oils mm-hmm. you're going to take away another little part of that skin barrier right and potentially increase the risk of an infection now we don't have there are many other factors as well fjordland mm. had significantly longer treks significantly fewer transitions right and it had pack crafting so there was time so wet and more ragged absolutely yeah so i mean mm. it's i think you could say it was down purely to the bars but i think it's probably one of many factors and i think if i think that it was like the perfect storm really mm, okay i always wondered what happened to that i haven't thought about that for yeah for a year or I so can, i can show you I can show you a copy <laughs> that's, like that's a good enough summary Gen-Z's, but... Gen-Z's feet are famous oh he's got his pictures, Couple of pictures Although, i remember that picture came up on I'm sure about on social media yeah, yeah 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 he looked didn't look too impressed um so yeah what did the feet actually look like i think i recall those like looking quite swollen and red or yeah something. so i guess there were a couple of different pictures mm. of of what they could look like depending on what the bugs were so right at that tinea or fungal end of the spectrum you had 
like a maceration or a, an erosion. So like if you imagine between the toes, it looked a bit swollen and uh. red and that kind of moist kind of sloth would be the word that I use, but like yellowy, reddish tissue on top that mm. you could just kind of wipe away. And that's actually layers of your skin that yeah. have been digested, That have got super munched. wet and are getting like mega inflamed from the, from the fungal stuff. Mm. And then you'd get this associated swelling and then you would start some people would start to get this infection kind of tracking up their legs kind of like a swelling and a bit of red right. could you see like the veins oh, not so much the veins yeah Grim other people infection. got more of a red <laughs> rash in the arches of their feet that looked more like i guess like old if you had well, how would i describe it red spots it would be like four to five millimeters across that were maybe a bit dry and associated mm. with a small amount of skin breakdown okay those were there as well kind and of looks like those little tinea yeah like circles yeah like tinea circles but a yeah. bit bigger and that maybe what they were and then other people would have more of a a kind of pitted appearance and that mm. pitted appearance is more towards the immersion foot end of mm. things so that's where you get your feet in water for too long mm. Though probably the conditions in Fiordland and the conditions people were encountering are not those that you would traditionally see trench foot in. Trench foot's a really cold water thing. There's also some, I mean, if we've been completely correct about the definitions. Mm -hmm. And then there's also um, tropical immersion foot, which is warmer water again. So I think there is a degree of immersion to it but i don't quite know if it would meet diagnostic criteria yeah. for those things yeah. but anyways but the colloquialism for it mm. um and That's we it. don't have a better one there was this so around the time we published our article there was this really good review article that came out about gram negative toe web infections which is a bit of a mouthful um but that was basically looking at a very similar thing cool and in a different format of an article so it was sort of a review article as opposed yep. to a case report and they i think that would be a much better i think that's much more descriptive of what is seen mm -hmm. it was, was seen at that race rather than immersion foot or trench foot mm -hmm. yeah oh, interesting cool well i was hoping to move the conversation more towards doctoring we seem to have gone there prematurely but of course i need to introduce you as um a, a race doctor and you've you've started yourself a business ascent medical um can you talk us through how you got into that and how that's maybe born may, maybe not of you being interested in sports medicine but deciding to you've decided to go the emergency medicine route with your main profession but you're still still hanging in there with ascent yeah uh, in, in some way yeah so can you talk again, us through your I'm, passions there again and, i'm no a bit like the event tracing i'm no i'm no major expert um i guess the there are many, many, many people who know much, much more about sports medicine than I do. I am sort of very, um, well, you're young as far as the doctors yeah. are concerned. Yeah. Um, but along with a, uh, some friends down at Rotorua, we provide medical care at some of the sports events, mainly around Rotorua and Taupo. Mm -hmm. Um, a friend had been doing it for a few years anyway and mm -hmm. needed some extra help. So I got involved as well. And so that involves some of the ultra marathons. So like the Tarawera mm -hmm. ultra, the Taupo ultra. Um, we also mm -hmm. help provide medical care at Crankworx Rotorua. Mm -hmm. And so for people who don't know what that looks like from the, from the um, participant's perspective, you are the race doctor. Yeah. So yeah, lots you're of these, the red tent that they end up in. Yeah. So lots, things of, go wrong. lots of these events will have medics on site who will be out in the course and do things. Mm -hmm. But some events, the event organizers feel that they have enough of a risk that they need a high level of medical care on site. So um generally what we'll do is for one of these events there'll still be the medics there they'll be out on the course and they'll be running the main safety side of things and we're kind of like a bit of a like pop-up clinic i guess at the finish mm. and as people finish and have various illnesses or ailments in. yeah we also play and i think this is probably where we've made the biggest difference is just in terms of preventative stuff so mm. much of the um problems in in ultras and other things like that can be prevented by a bit of preparation so we kind of offer like an opinion from that more medically focused area mm -hmm. um on how 
runners can be better prepared. So yeah, we, we do that, and that yeah. sits quite nicely alongside work. Um, well, not right now. Work's quite busy at the moment, but it generally fits yeah. quite well alongside actual work in a hospital. Cool. Uh, well, yeah. Can you go deeper onto what kind of things you you see in adventure racing and um, ultra running? And mm. yeah, you, you mentioned so, some kind of preventative approaches. Yeah. So we haven't actually laid down. Like, what, we haven't what do you see? Done coverage for an adventure race, but we've done plenty of ultras. Yeah. Um, and we. And I imagine ultras are different to crankworks in terms of the yeah. injuries you get rolling yeah, through. Crankworks. But it would be cool to hear about crankworks as well. Crankworks is different. I'm sure you've got some some gory. A few. Uh, there must be a few gory ones on crankworks. Uh, I'll. We'll, we'll, we'll go there. Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll let's see. talk about ultras first. Yeah. Um. The so at ultras there's, um, a whole spectrum of things that can happen. People are pushing their body to or beyond its kind of physiological norm. The top guys it doesn't get easier for them they just go faster so someone may be out there grafting for 21 hours and that provide provides a sort of strain on their body mm. but just as much the the winner in eight or nine hours has put a probably even a greater strain on their body mm -hmm. um different parts of the field tend to see different problems more um and the big challenge really is that lots of the main problems that ultra runners will face all mimic each other so i guess you could kind of break them down into um i guess the way to think about it is your body's trying to maintain a normal operating environment trying to maintain homeostasis mm -hmm. and there are multiple ways that it beca can become deranged during the race so i kind of think that's a good way to start from it so the first thing you can think about would be say your body temperature you can get too cold or you can get too hot you can Think about hydration and fluids. Mm -hmm. You can get too wet or too dry. Um, when you say too hot or too cold, you mean just kind of acutely too hot or too cold, or you mean your ability to regulate temperature is up the wop? Well, both, yeah. So with all of these, so the, the too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, um, all of those things, mm -hmm. your body loses its ability to really accurately regulate them mm -hmm. which is why you start getting these wider variations right and then you end up at what kind of one end of the spectrum it might be a cold day mm -hmm. but someone comes in too hot okay okay i would have thought everyone just gets slammed to one end generally but... people do but you can have people pop out the other end so if you've got like a middle range temperature day in yeah. at an ultra you could have some people who pre present I see. There'll be 50 50 split, but the extremes still over. It's a bell curve. Yeah. This, yeah. You're still going to get either end of the bell curve. Yeah. Um, at a cold race, you get end up with people too cold, and then it mm -hmm. kind of amplifies all of the other problems. If your body gets too cold, you maybe lose the ability to. Um, you, you affect your hydration as well, mm -hmm. and then you might have an effect on your sugar levels. Like you, you see this cascade of problems. And. Mm -hmm. So being hypothermic or being um, dehydrated or having a water excess or having low sugar will mm. all present in a really similar way. So it's about having like a systematic way to approach the unwell patient at the end of a, one of these races yeah. to try and figure out what's going on. Yeah, because the of, treatment would be different. Yeah, the tr treatment's yeah. different. There are some elements of the treatment that, that are the same, but you want to try and quickly decide which one is the main problem. Mm -hmm address that and try and get them feeling better as quick as you can and we're kind of a on the on the finish line um support so we're there to sort out the vast majority of people who just need some minor input and mm. oftentimes it's just yeah. some advice and and often you feel like you're being real mean so it'll be stuff yeah. like you need to get changed right now <laughs> you need to go and get you sound like clothes. My mom. yeah it's basically there's a lot of mothering you need to get yeah. out of those clothes i know you're really tired but you need to get out of those clothes you need to drink some of this stuff and yeah. keep drinking we're going to warm you up we're going to make sure that we can slowly get you drinking again and then you'll be okay. fine and that's the majority really right um it's identifying the ones who are who are sicker who we can either improve mm. and, and get better or require further care at the hospital and right really, so you then you send them off with the ambulance or something yeah we're really point, we're yeah. really lucky that lots of the events we do mm -hmm. previously tarawea used to finish in kodo which was a bit more isolated but mm -hmm. that finishes really close to the hospital now we've got like yeah. really good backup mm. yeah 
Sweet. What are some of the other things with uh, ultra running that you've you know, seen um, over the past few years and advice that you can share? Now, did, was it you that came up with the weighing thing or did you no, kind no, of get no, that no, from no, somewhere no, else? No, no. We yeah. got that from somewhere else. There's yeah. lots of really... Because that wasn't... You at least brought it to oh, the local ben, events. Ben did. Or the Ben. ben yeah, okay. yeah, so Ben's the other, the other, other path, path. So Ben kind of started it all off. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the rationale behind the weighing... Yeah. is and you mentioned about too much water not enough water mm-hmm. so there's something you can get called exercise associated hyponatremia mm-hmm. which is basically where your body has a low sodium levels sodium being one of the key electrolytes in your mm-hmm. blood and usually it's because of dilution so it's because of water excess mm. increasing the amount of solvent rather than the amount of solute so yeah you essentially dilute your sodium and that has been a problem in especially Ironman triathlons and other ultra endurance sports. And Orca Marathon five or so years ago hit the deck. Was it with um, the AH? Yep. Okay. I didn't, I didn't yep, know that. Yep. It does Which was a- like, yeah, I remember people at work being like, what is this? And Because um, it is counterintuitive. It does like, seem a bit counterintuitive. Yeah. But, yeah, but he overcooked, overcooked the water. Yeah, like water intoxication. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. It's drinking too much. Yeah. Too much water while your body is in a state mm. where it's trying to do things to defend volume our body can respond to increased concentration of salts in our blood or Mm -hmm. changes in fluid volume and it's got all these interlinked mechanisms for trying to maintain normal electrolytes or or tonicity it's called concentration osmolarity concentration of um solutes in our blood and also the amount of blood and circulating volume we have and sometimes in various situations you can actually make those normal compensatory mechanisms become like maladaptive and that's what happens in eah right so, so your body's actually driving to some degree yeah in you, the wrong direction yeah okay I, I thought you were just like overpowering so the you are system. you kind of i guess depends on how you look at it well i don't think it's we complex. can yeah we won't really go into the details today <laughs> but your body is not able to accurately regulate okay it's not re- yeah. adequately able to compensate for the amount of pure mm-hmm. water that you're putting into the system. Um, so the main, the the worst case scenario you could have for EAH would be if you were doing a event that was probably longer, so maybe like twelve hours ish, mm-hmm. and you took heaps of drugs that like messed with how your kidneys worked, so okay. things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which affect the normal functioning of your kidneys and then you drank heaps of water didn't eat anything right and you kept drinking water despite right so your kidneys are not um sending the water out yeah and you could say that yeah <laughs> you're yeah. ballooning yeah ballooning with water yeah so people will the end stage of it is that you can develop a cerebral edema so you can get swelling around your brain says you come mm. to death oh well and okay. you can also end up with this like hyponatremic pulmonary edema so like fluid in your lungs mm. and the treatment for it is to control the sodium and it goes back to normal but there's these these quite serious things yeah so if you just occur. add sodium does the water kind of soak back out too kind of you still got to get rid of the water yeah you do your body is still making urine so it's yeah. not like you're an urine okay so the, you, you do expel it you have to expel it to really come right yeah you uh it's again it's complicated yeah you do (laughs) essentially you do yeah and then you the treatment for it would be a correction of the sodium so Mm -hmm. you do that with we use hypertonic saline so that's hypertonic means more sodium Mm -hmm. than in your blood plasma so you would have some hypertonic saline that'll top up the sodium in circulation a little and then your body will return to homeostasis it will start excreting some water it'll basically settle back into its normal rhythm so Mm. the difficulty with ea well the thing with eah exercise associated hyponatremia is that generally people will have a weight gain it's not always so we'd expect people to lose say four percent of their body weight in a race like Mm -hmm. an ultra yeah some a ballpark so you got a pre-race weight you got a Mm post-race weight Generally, if, as long as they're down, that's probably fine. If their weight's the same or if it's gone up, right. it doesn't mean they've got hyponatremia. It increases their risk of having it. Yeah, they could and, have eaten a lot. 
Yeah, or they could be. Yeah, they could have eaten a lot. That's a possibility. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. I swear that happens on ultras. It does. Some yeah. people gorging. I, I see them weight, gorging. The predictiveness of the weight gets a bit different, a bit less accurate the further we down we go in the field. Yeah. So right at the tail end, it can really be a bit hard to interpret. Okay. Um, also, the um, there are some limitations. We don't get people naked at at registration right and you could have wet, them naked wet at the finish we, we, there are limitations we have yeah. ways that we work around it yeah. practical practical elements it's also a bit cruel yeah. to ask someone to undo their shoes at the finish to get weighed so we have it's, yeah. it's not a perfect but it's like it gives us an indication mm-hmm. if someone is two kilos over they're probably at least the same and they fall mm-hmm. into that high risk category whereas if they're four kilos down they could still have it but they're at lower risk yeah. and other diagnoses move up mm-hmm. so Generally, all these things will present with like feeling generally unwell and tired, a little bit of nausea, maybe some vomiting. Mm-hmm. Um, potentially, they will be a little confused. Those that, that's dehydration, that's hypoglycemia, that's exercise associated hyponatremia. Mm. But if someone's weight changes, that's a key discriminator that can help us to get um, EAH out from mm. the others. Again, it's not hard and fast. A blood sugar test can help get us out and then temperature measurements can help get mm-hmm. us out so lots of people we see at the finish who are in that sort of com- a bit maybe a bit out of it maybe a bit fatigued maybe mm. a bit vomity we need to think about their weight their sugars their um temperature yeah and try and correct those as best we can so what what things can they do while they're out on the course before the course well to I, minimize their chances of ending up in that category i think I think not overreaching is one thing. It's, I mean, this okay. is, this you is, mean in terms of so we, the result, like people are just pushing into the red zone too, too much. No, I think, I think it's not that. I think it's being really sensible about your progression as an athlete. I okay. think, oh, yep, yep. Not, I think really having a think and saying, is A, why am I doing this? B, I don't, is 100 kilometers the best distance for me at this point? And mm-hmm. I think everyone is capable of working up to it, but I think these aren't necessarily the people at the tail end of the field. Some of the people at the tail end of the field are extremely well organized and right. uh, have stuck to their pace and they've done a great job because they've looked at it and, and said, this is what I want to achieve. Mm-hmm. I want to do this distance. I'm going to do this pace. I've got this food. They're supremely organized, some of those people. Right. There are people scattered through the whole field who have possibly should have done a shorter distance, possibly mm-hmm. should have maybe gone a bit slower things like that that overreaching i think really in sport we're all about like Mm. just push through push through you could do it and i think that's great but sometimes i think that that's it's a it's a it's a process Mm. and you'd probably be better if it's your first ultra not trying to really really push right on 100 k's like maybe ease your way into it maybe yeah. gather some information first mm. and do it as a progression so you're saying these people who are possibly towards the end of the field but are really prepared they have worked their way up or yeah, yeah yeah they have yeah so i think yeah. some of those people are, they've are, done some 50s and they've done yeah. an 80 and they're and they've done a really nice progression up to it yeah, okay whereas there are other people scattered all through who can who maybe have maybe winging it too much. maybe winging it a bit too much okay. so that, that'll be one factor another yeah. factor would be like have a plan a and a plan b for your nutrition and hydration so it gets thrown up all the time people won't be able to keep their food down Mm. for whatever reason so have tried different things in training don't say i always have i always have tailwind i always have three of these goods i always have a baked potato but because it it works perfectly until it doesn't absolutely right you need like a plan b and you need to have that in Uh, a drop bag for you so i think that's i think that's key the amount of people we see at the finish who are like Oh, I don't know what it is today. I just couldn't keep food down. Mm-hmm. And it could be many things. It could be a bit of stress. It could be the nerves. It could be maybe you're feeling real fresh because this is your pinnacle race. You've yeah. tapered a bit and your training's worked. So you're going a bit faster, but it's actually like maybe reduce the blood supply a little bit to your gut. So maybe it's mm. not processing as well. Interesting. So having a, like a different set of food, a more compl- a different arrangement that you can change that tack you've, on. That you've you tried. Need I think you need right. to have like okay. a plan. I think... I mean, I say all this as someone yeah. who's not, I mean, have I, I've not really, my longest trail race would be like 40 something. So this yeah. is all purely observational. Um, but I think people who have a plan B pack that they can switch to mm-hmm. wicked. 
that's really good. And because sometimes if you're like, oh, my emergent, and think about your plan B as well. Sometimes if a goo is your emergency and you're a bit feeling a bit vomity and a bit of right, bit loose it's coming motions, back up with everything else. It's, you're going to check the goo in and all it's going to do is it's going to have that that um, laxative effect of just having a big sugar load and you're just going to poo worse. So I think I, I'd probably lean towards a more whole foods mm -hmm. plan B or just something that which you have tried and you know that in some situations has worked fine for you mm -hmm. in training. So I'd say that's the other thing. Yeah, that, that, that's important as well with a, a plan B. Again, in training, test the plan B as you test the plan A. Absolutely, absolutely. Otherwise, it's not the plan B. It's not the plan B. You're just, just winging it again. It's just winging it, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think also another option, another thing which is really helpful is, is making it easy for your body. So um, if we've talked, we've kind of hung this on like, your body's trying to maintain homeostasis. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling a bit with your food and your body's working hard in that regard and you're trying mm -hmm. to get that right, just try and optimize other things. So trying to keep warm is really good or get cool. So trying to think, okay, so this isn't going great, but what are the mm -hmm. other things that I have an influence on in this race? And no, like if you are feeling a bit vomity and then you're focused on that, so you get a bit cold because you're going mm -hmm. slower and then you get like, problem with your feet and then maybe you're a bit chafy as well having the ability that if the day's not going to plan to be like all right it's a it's a long day i'm going to reset a little bit i can't do anything about my stomach right now i know i've got a drop bag down the line i'm just going to button off a bit make myself warm think about optimizing other things mm -hmm. and then we'll see if i can get myself back into this right i think that is important as well so as opposed to the other mindset which is time is always the priority like race time is always the priority. yeah well i can't eat i can't eat i can't eat i can't right. eat that's just the thing which goes round and round and round in your head mm -hmm. and i know that's oh, that happens to me all the time a little bit of yeah. adversity in a race and you're like oh, that's the problem that's it right I just gotta get over this and not trying novel things like not trying something random just having having a plan for these times of adversity mm -hmm. and being able to approach it as like okay things aren't going to plan here's my three or four options of what i can do mm-hmm I'm going to try these things. I'm going to make it easy for my body. I'm going to go to my plan B food option. Yeah. And I'm going to maybe button the pace off a little bit. Sweet. And you see people who have low points and they, they recover oh, yeah. from them. You see people who do yeah. an excellent job of this. We see a small proportion of the field. Yeah. Lots of people do an excellent job of this throughout yeah. the field. I'm always really impressed by some of the later finishers who are yeah. really organized with food. Um, yeah. The other thing is the race. We always say this in our race briefings. The race doesn't end at the finish line. That would be another... Oh, I think yeah. if I could That's change, I could change one thing. I would say that everyone not only do they have to have drop bags, they have to have a finish bag, mm. and there's compulsory gear check for their finish bag, because there's nothing. Yeah, what worse. would be what would be in that compulsory gear check for the finish bag? The finish it would bag. be slightly different to. Yeah, yeah so their, I'd their say it's stuff. it's nothing earth shattering. So I'd mm. say you need to have a towel, you need to have a full mm. change of clothes, like everything, mm -hmm. including like like base layers to keep you warm yeah trousers a sweatshirt a warm jacket a little bit of food because sometimes at races there's not always food available mm -hmm. so it could be like i don't know a piece of cold pizza from the night before could be some yeah. nuts could be something a, a range of things which you can have yeah. um a little bit of water is a really good idea because we need you to be potentially um having something to sip on yeah. in a bigger format so that we don't have to be bringing like you don't have to be like little cups yeah because you could easily say well there's water at the finish well if you're stuck in the medical tent and there's can, shit going on you're not going to be walking over there to oh, get the can, water we, I mean, can, get, we, can, get, we can get you water but i think yeah. that like just having being a little bit self-sufficient is really good because you never mm. know what's going to happen maybe yeah. there'll be an issue with water at that point they might have yeah. run out or something or and if it's not water it could be your favorite um recovery drink or something mm -hmm. like that um and then i think a pair of shoes or jandals or sandals or something because like there's nothing worse than finishing your race you want to whip your shoes off obviously mm. and then you don't have anything to put on you've got to walk in like your bare macerated <laughs> feet across the um <laughs> the car, car park. Park. and then the last thing i'd say would be a a realistic plan of how you're going to get home <laughs> oh, surely people haven't <laughs> you'd be surprised, you'd be surprised. So some people i mean <laughs> there's a whole spectrum and some people are, are excellent but i think having it's really important to acknowledge that you'll potentially feel like a bag of 
soggy potatoes at the finish line <laughs> and walking four kilometers to your hotel may not be a realistic option so i think having a, a plan or plan mm-hmm. a and plan b of how you're going to get home i'd include that in my compulsory gear check for an ultra mm. yeah. redefine the finish line <laughs> yeah finish line is your beard and to be honest like f- to be honest a tatara finish would be a perfectly suitable bed at the moment that's got an awesome finish line inside yep. you've got bean bags like great it's mm. warm people were sleeping on the bean bags which is great yeah um but i think personally i think i'd rather be in my own bed at yeah. The finish. yeah um so i think that stuff is none of it's like super yeah it's not like high brown medical stuff it's just like basics really yeah that can easily be overshadowed by the magnitude of the event and the emotions around it. Yeah. I'm so Even, focused on the race. Yeah, yeah. I think there's lots of these little bits and pieces which you can do in the background which pay dividends and mean that if, because realistically, most people are going to be doing a couple of these events a year. They're quite like a significant time and money goes into doing them. You want to make sure that you've kind of got, you've thought about lots of the controllables. And it's hmm. one thing to have a, your, full 100 percent race plan but i think it's it's really good that's that you have the backup so you still have something to fall back on so you don't leave the race empty-handed yeah um that's right like we are hoping to have a good experience and it's pretty inevitable that once in a while you are going to have a, a bad experience and trying to have that safety net i think it might seem unnecessary until it's needed mm. it might be one in ten races but yeah pretty stoked yeah when it's there it also means it's it's something it's another cool little element you can add to your training as well like instead of being like Mm. i've got my third long my third like four hour saturday run in a row you're like oh but my secondary objective of today's training is i want to try this alternative fueling strategy yeah so it can give you like extra little bits and pieces to focus on during Mm. your training which is helpful i think when you're doing an endurance sport Mm. Sweet. Is there anything else that you'd add on on the ultra stuff? Ooh, nah. It's, from from I, your experience as a doctor, I I think I think it's one thing I must say. I think it's incredible the the very pinnacle, the fast, the people like the gym warms leads and stuff. Yeah, like it's <laughs> that's next, next level. Yeah, like it's, I, I'm routinely stunned by how fresh those those guys and girls look. Yeah, Mel Heron, she's the same. People who've like just done this huge run and at an extremely high pace and they look fresh as a box of daisies yeah incredible conditioning yeah. incredible you, preparation you look on strava and you see these like koms on all these climbs on rotorua and you look at the dating like that was an entire way. <laughs> they did that in a 100k like, race well, <laughs> i said that i can do it fresh like yeah it's, yeah it's pretty impressive yeah so, there to be witnessed yeah i think ultra also i think hope well this is what i'm hoping one yeah. day is that ultra sort of morphs more into like a like na- with a bigger navigation and a bigger backcountry element mm-hmm. like, kind of i because my dad talks about this the old mountain marathon the old mountain marathon yeah, yeah before our time maybe yeah but there seemed to be quite a following there and it died away for whatever reason people yeah. found trail running i don't know i remember when i was but it was quite simple it was like topo like up the spur along the ridge line not hard nav, down, yeah. down the track but I you're going like somewhere 14 or 15 new. when i did kawaki challenge for the first time okay and so that, that, that was it as one of those that used to be one of those mountain marathons okay I, I, I thought it was just a trail race nah so okay it had like two day pairs oh. it had all that sort of stuff yeah it was very before its time i think well right. it wasn't it was there were lots of races like that mm. but i think now if you had a race like that that'd be awesome you camp at kuru mm. in the beautiful campground you have people going out on not tricky navigation mm-hmm. it's basically tracks but through amazing bush yeah and you also have like a short little race i think it tried to rein maybe the race tried to reinvent itself as i think i remember like a six hour trail run so maybe that was like the the dying breath yeah of the event but no i think that was pretty cool and there seemed to be a lot of people there i mean i was mm. 15 so maybe there were fewer people there than i remember yeah. but i think those mountain marathons would be mm. cool if they come back or like semi-organized fastest known time yeah race weekends interesting stuff like that yeah i think that would be quite that'd be cool. compelling races um round like mm. and the thing is that you can do them anywhere like if you wanted to do a like out the window here looking over at the tangahuas like you could do a pretty wicked race there yeah 
it'd be interesting as far as navigation there's a lot of decisions to make you're not just running for two hours on one yeah, trail and, and then going left it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be extreme navigation no, either it can be some degree of attention to the yeah map. it can be like you needing to know what which way you're going to go at which junction and yep. yeah there's whole degrees of difficulty but i think yep. that'd be pretty cool and like if you especially like um for example the thunderbolt loop in mm -hmm. the kaimanawas would be really cool mm. um there's a degree of route finding up on the tops there's some options of the ways that you can go i think that stuff would be yeah awesome well of course you have experienced one similar race earlier this year and i'm de definitely keen to talk about it you can <laughs> say what you want on the podcast um but as far as i see it was a good experiment uh, maybe you want to to take us through through the race and um so re re revenant i'm talking about revenant. The race you're talking about yeah, yeah. and it's in interesting it looks like it's gonna i think it will I think hang it, around i think it will hang around yeah yeah but i mean it's it's a different format and it's i think a hard format to pull off it attracts a, a very small subset of already quite crazy people to do something that's kind of impossible but trying to organize an event um like that yeah maybe you do it differently but i'm keen to hear about your experience yeah. at least starting and seeing that whole process that they had going on down there yeah i think revenant is how is it defined how is it presented to you once you were down there and all the organization around it heaps like, of questions that that was yeah. just like from the moment we got there pretty much until we started it was just what's this going to entail are there going to be new okay. rules and i even so think, they tried to make it mysterious yeah yeah mystique, okay lots of mystique um yeah. i think um scott and levi um Levo put on something which they had a their idea of what they wanted to do and they stuck to their okay to their yeah. um vision for it mm -hmm. um i think I personally would have liked uh, navigation's what attracted me to it. Yeah. And the fact that after you've done one lap, it's just the same lap afterwards and will be forever. Yeah. Sort of takes a bit of the attraction away from me. Right. You navigate it once and then you run it. And then, like, then you run times it multiple times, times, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. It's hard to get a course which is. Um, well, it depends on what you're trying to do i think that is supposed to be a big a, it's supposed to be a physical challenge and a mental yeah. challenge and it certainly is mm -hmm. um there are complete mind-bending legs on that where you drop 900 meters down a four-wheel drive road to get a really yeah. easy control and then immediately climb back up the same four-wheel drive road 900 yeah. meters it's meant to be sadistic it's meant to be sadistic yeah and i think that if you're going to include stuff like that and and really amp up that like mental battle the yeah. cost is you probably don't have the same degree of backcountry. Mm -hmm. um, I did it with, with Maddie Jeans, with Jeansy, mm -hmm. and um, we, yeah, we made some cock-ups on the navigation um, early on. Um, our fault or not our fault, <laughs> hard to say. Um, but cost us a bit of time, and then we kind of settled into like our trundling mode, we yeah. walked or fast walked 90 percent yeah and on our second lap at least we would have been on target time wise mm -hmm. so you don't really need to run i don't think right i think if you run the tracks make no nav errors mm -hmm. and fast walk the rest of it and don't stop you'll take it off and mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure angus watson will do it this year yep yep um and potentially others i yep. reckon i reckon chris would have smashed yep. it yep he can yeah. keep plowing on for that length of time yeah no chris, problem. yeah chris vaughn would have i think he would have had no issues i don't think he would have yeah mm. he, fast enough to move through it mm -hmm. um so the, i think those... it's not really a mountain marathon it's more of a like it's more of a it's often its own little circle of these yeah. it's just a massive physical and mental challenge yeah um, but not so much a technical challenge like a 24-hour row gain no. where the, the navigation is a huge part of it yeah essential yeah. part of it yeah I think you, yeah, it's, I think a 24 hour row gain. Mm. I, um, while we were out there, the event that we thought was kind of similar was talk. Yeah. So talk, you are going around looking for these 
very difficult uh, to find <laughs> at least in talk you can skip and thing if you can't find it yeah but you got 24 hours you're usually in a relatively small area and you'll be like we just went here and we're going back here yeah. or you have out and backs and things like that mm -hmm. you might have to go up a crazy hill to get a control because that's how they've set it so there were some similarities mm -hmm. there um talk has much more social element to it because it's yeah. there's a few hundred people there you're in a big team whereas it revenue, does sound a lot of fun even people who um, i know who don't you know train the whole season talks yeah great yeah event. they just talk, talk rallies them yeah they yeah, love it such a good event it's been around for yeah. like 50 years or whatever it's yeah it's still the test of time it's a very good event yeah um revenant was yeah a bit different it's a totally different challenge i think if you're mm. after something which is like super tough mentally and physically yeah and a test of of those rather than mm -hmm. a test of your navigation skills or your mm -hmm. pure running then it's a good one we also t had and so they're keeping the same course I this, this so, is yeah. why it's secret course yeah secret ish yeah, yeah. i don't know how they're gonna yeah i don't know how they're gonna keep it secret forever but i guess barclays has managed to stay relatively secret yeah for a long time so yeah i um I think it's yeah i don't know i don't know enough about barclays barclays barclay yeah again barclays. it just sounds like it's one of those random events that's built up this legendary reputation because it it tried to do something different and has stuck to its guns on and it's what good, it is and it's a good i mean it's a good story and it's got a very yeah. well put together film about it on netflix I think yeah i think once that film came too. out it's um definitely helped i think yeah i'm maybe a bit less compelled about it yeah because it doesn't have that navigation test mm -hmm. um but i mean there were everyone there were a bunch of people who were there who were raving about it and yep. it certainly is a pretty massive challenge mm. yeah um, um did you want to talk about crankworks at all um ah oh, it's just is it just broken wrists it's just people smashing themselves off on mountain bikes. yeah because there is <laughs> it's somewhat entertaining for for the rest of us oh, i guess I'd, you know I'd, the number I'd, of I'd, hours on youtube of I think There's it's people a, crashing mountain bikes. I think it's like any sport. You always the stuff that tends to make the headlines is the bad stuff, and, and yeah. it's actually like high performance sport. And they, while the stuff of people getting injured makes the headlines, lots yeah. of people don't, and yeah. it's sort of comes with the territory. Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's not it's not that interesting. It's, it's really. not super interesting. It's, no. good. it's just cheap entertainment, really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like broken, of, yeah. <laughs> broken arms. Yeah. Um. Cool. So, what else is um on the horizon for you? Um. Well, probably we'll keep plugging away at um adventure racing yeah um trying to i've got a bit of an imbalanced time at the moment with having to do a bit more work at the moment mm -hmm. so not didn't race gods in this year have got a bit of a, a few months off while i have to do some things for work yeah and then yeah look to go with the rotor rural god zone next year which will cool which will be pretty Back good to one of your many homes yeah yeah i think yeah. i think Rotorua long have we like every time we'd finish god's and be like oh it'd be awesome if they had one in the north mm. island i don't know if the south islanders necessarily agree with that but certainly coming from having spent pretty much my whole life living yeah. or north yeah um it'll be different it will certainly be different yeah but there'll be some i think it's great yeah i was really stoked to hear it yeah get further afield and like still holding out for the central plateau god zone oh, don't know who knows who knows, who knows? Yeah. yeah i think that would be very it's unique a, as well from you know th this event is so visible overseas and to display something so unique as in central plateau would be it's a pretty incredible wild, there's some pretty wild country out east out as towards well. the um Uruwetas yeah that area as well so yeah, yeah yeah it'll be it'll be exciting i think very wild and then yeah a bit more orienteering will be good i think orienteering yeah. new zealand seems like it's gone through a um it's i mean the high performance obviously the top end is looking mm. really good with people being right on podiums and things internationally um but it seems like people have maybe lifted the level of yeah it's this it's too. this big pyramid that's building like the foundation's getting wider yeah. and the top's getting higher uh, yeah. so it's, it's really exciting time to be to be involved in new zealand orienteering i think yeah so well best of luck with um god's own coming up mm -hmm. And hope the training goes well and you can manage all your all your other jobs yep. and uh for uh, are there any places that um people can find you if they're interested in seeing what you do i know you used to have a blog yeah i've kind of pretty much i've kind of stopped most of that stuff to be honest it's yep. kind of fallen by the wayside um mm -hmm. i've got quite a lot of the old 
sessions and things we used to do on on there, but yeah, no, I don't really don't really have time anymore to be honest. Yeah, well, we'll take a look and see if there's anything relevant on yeah. there, and then we might link it up. Yep. But yeah, thanks a lot for the time. I'm. Sh it's been really interesting, and I'm sure there's a lot of value in there for people who are for the huge number of people who are looking at getting into trail ultra and this bit of a this sensation around doing these long races yeah. for just uh, um, average people. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of lot of really important hopefully, um, hopefully, yeah. wisdom in there. There's um usually for the races we'll usually do a briefing as well anyway. So lots of that stuff is kind of a rehash of what we'd talk about in a race briefing. But yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks, Tom. If you're enjoying the Perfect Flow podcast and want more value from it in the future, there are some ways you can support it. The first is to rate or leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or other platforms where it's available. The second is to share this podcast or specific episodes on social media or with friends. The third is to get involved more directly through the Perfect Flow page on Facebook, where I'm trying to construct a more interactive community. I want Perfect Flow to belong to the listeners, and if you tell me what topics you're most interested in, or even suggest specific guests, I'll do my best to make it happen. This is your opportunity to be part of something that answers your questions and adds value to your life. Another good reason to follow Perfect Flow on Facebook is that I post links to episodes, blog posts, and anything I find useful to this page. It's a great way to follow my training, racing, and learning. Another great way to stay engaged is to subscribe to genebeverage.nz. This way you will get podcasts and blogs emailed to you, avoiding the clutter of Facebook. I don't know where this project will take us, but the reception so far has been positive. Who knows where we might be in a few years.